$4.2 billion was spent in lobbying in the U.S. in 2023 alone. Lobbying. 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 An astonishing amount of money was spent on lobbying. Lobbying plays a pretty huge role in how U.S. policies are made. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and let's explore the world of lobbying and how it all started. Picture a typical American school lunch. You're probably picturing milk as part of it, right? Here's the thing. The fact that you've been picturing milk as part of that school lunch, well, that's by design. You see, milk has been an essential component of the US national school lunch program since the 40s. And surprisingly, it has very little to do with actual health benefits. Despite the very heavy promotion of cow's milk as being good for a child's health, it actually might be bad for them. Unlike Europe, half or more Americans are lactose intolerant. And that is why milk actually makes up one of the most common food allergies in American kids under 16. Also, it might be harming their long-term health, increasing the risk of cancer, diabetes, and obesity according to some studies. So why is milk still on the school lunch menus? The simple answer is lobbying. You see, a lot of what may be seen as a staple of American life didn't just emerge organically. Rather, it was the result of extensive lobbying by big businesses. So the question is, how come big businesses have so much influence over policies? And why is it still legal? Let's break it down. So first, we need to understand the distinction between bribery and lobbying. Bribery is an effort to directly buy power for specific results. Whereas lobbying, on the other hand, is an effort to influence power. It isn't as direct as bribery. As a lobbyist, you aren't really engaging in bribery because you're not paying a public official to effectively buy their decision. Instead, you're helping to shape laws and regulations and policies for the benefit of the group that you represent. So as a lobbyist, you organize people to create studies, surveys, or operate a large media campaign to try and sway a politician's outlook. You see, lobbyists can't directly pay politicians. However, what they can do is hint or allude to the fact that they might donate to a politician's election campaign. So you see, there's a subtle difference here. Also, the aimed outcome is very different. Lobbyists aim to influence laws which impacts everybody, whereas bribery is probably done for a very specific reason that impacts very specific people. To better illustrate this difference, let's go with an example. Let's say that there's a legislation that a specific senator is supposed to support. However, a certain company or a group doesn't want that legislation to go through. In this scenario, bribery would be directly showering the senator with money to get him to vote against the legislation. However, lobbying would be an indirect, more soft and subtle approach to create an impression with the senator that unless he votes against the legislation, his voters would be upset. So that's the very subtle difference. Lobbying is more kosher, it's more acceptable. Lobbying as a political practice has seen rapid growth in the recent decades. In the early 2000s, only four countries had formal lobbying laws. Today, that is 29. Even in countries where lobbying is not considered legal, there are massive lobby groups representing the interests of these giant corporations. In the special case of the United States though, lobbying has not been around for decades, but centuries. As early as 1792, we have recorded instances where lobby groups would try to influence government action. And as early as 1830s, we would see the term lobbyist appear and start being used to describe individuals engaged in a lobby. Nevertheless, this all remained largely unregulated. Well, that's up until this man came into the story. You see, there were concerns about Nazi-backed lobbies trying to influence politicians. That's why the US Congress passed the first Foreign Agents Registration Act. And this would be followed by the Lobbying Registration Act a few years later. Both of these were aimed at bringing greater transparency to the lobbying industry. Now, while these acts and regulations were in place, it wasn't really enough. The US would be hit by a big corruption scandal in the 90s, where a company called the Wendell Corporation failed to disclose its lobbying on required federal forms and outright bribed politicians. 
They made use of ambiguity in the laws, and that allowed the corporation to essentially bribe politicians to grant it government contracts. This was a huge scandal back then, and it resulted in the Lobbying Disclosure Act. And then in 2007, a major amendment would be passed, and it had a really funny name. It was called the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act. And this very cleverly named Government Act required lobbyists to file disclosure reports more frequently. And this act would also restrict gifts that lobbyists could give to Congress members or their staff workers. This was done with the intention to ensure that lobbyists would have less influence on these political decision makers. But here's the thing, regardless of how many laws you pass to regulate it, if you ask an average citizen, they'd probably say that lobbying as a practice should be outright illegal. I'm also curious to hear your comments about this, so please do leave a comment down below. And also please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already so that you get notified about the weekly videos that I put out about history and financial topics. Anyway, the main argument you'd usually hear against lobbying is that it subverts democracy. You're probably thinking that what good is a vote if some smooth-talking consultant can have more influence on a policy making process than actual votes. But as with many controversial practices in place, making lobbying illegal is actually not that simple. In fact, it could actually make matters worse. Lobbying isn't just a big way for evil companies to influence legislation. It's also a means for the minority voices to be heard. The fact is that lobbying is not exclusive to businesses, and many NGOs and grassroots level organizations also engage in the practice. It's frustrating, but the truth is, lobbying is a double-edged sword. It can lead to laws being passed that favor the powerful and corrupt, sure. However, at the same time, lobbying can also be the only effective means for some people to get their voice heard by the government. And that's why it's considered as part of the First Amendment, the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. But basically in modern times, that would essentially say it's a right to lobby. In addition, essentially in a large country such as the US, lobbying helps policymakers make better sense of what the many competing interests are for its diverse citizens. In fact, in some cases, lobbying actually becomes an education tool for government legislators and other officials. It also allows for individual interests to gain power in numbers. You see, these interest groups can actually gather the concerns of the people that they're representing and share their know-how on how to address these concerns with the politicians. So now the politicians can have this information and then decide what to do with that knowledge. So it's up to them and they're better equipped to serve their citizens. You see, the problem is that the foundation of lobbying enables the small guys to have their voices heard. And that's a very good thing, just like I explained earlier. But we see many big businesses and interest groups using these very foundations to their benefit and big because of their access to almost unlimited money and resources, they can end up influencing decisions far more effectively than any other small lobby group representing a minority or a small group of average citizens. This is where big companies can elbow their way in because they have the resources and the money, whereas the average Joe does not. So here's the bottom line. If we try to abolish lobbying, those with money and connections would still find a way to influence the law. The ones truly impacted would be these citizen groups lacking these resources. That's why I said earlier, getting rid of lobbying or making it illegal actually harms the small guys. But keeping it makes sure that the big guys are always winning. Like I said earlier, lobbying is definitely a double-edged sword. But I know that's just one perspective. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on lobbying as well. Do you think it can be better regulated or could there be an alternative? I'd love to hear it in the comments below. If you like this video, I'm sure you'll like this video about the history of campaign financing and donations in the US. Check it out here, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you soon.